We will get you some technical aid. Here it, he comes now. Yes, I too am having the, the freezing mouse issue. Thank you, uh, Mayor Burton, members of council. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold tonight. My name is Stephen D'Agostino. I'm a partner at Thompson Rogers. I've been involved in the siting of wireless telecommunications uh, facilities since the late 1980s. And although I'm here on behalf of my clients, Bell, TELUS, and Rogers, I'm hoping that council will think of me as a bit of a resource. Uh, I've been involved in all of your iterations of protocols going back to 1997 and was in fact involved in discussions with, uh, with this council's predecessor in the mid-90s with respect to, to that protocol. I look forward to engaging you in discussion tonight and participating in the future discussions which, which staff have, uh, have advised you of. I, I want to start off, uh, Your Worship, by saying that the wireless industry is committed to working with municipalities such as Oakville to develop protocols that enable us to meet our needs in your community. Your community is our customers, and the regulator, Industry Canada, of course, which has its own set of overlay of requirements that we also must adhere to. What we're looking for in a protocol, sir, is clarity, certainly, certainty, timeliness, and an ability to provide services needed. These, from our point of view, are the, the, the key elements of an approval process. With this sort of a framework in place, we can then focus our resources on finding sites that are successful, sensitive to their surrounding land uses, but also fit within our network infrastructure. And I'll come to that in a, in a moment. We, are, we recognize and are mindful of community concerns with regards to site aesthetics. There is much we can support in the draft that's before Council, but we also have concerns. In our view, based on our experience across the country, the application requirements are unduly onerous given the scale and modest impact of a wireless communications facility. Some of the requirements are in fact out of order given the way Industry Canada and its other agencies uh, approve towers such as Transport Canada and Nav Canada requirements. Public consultation requirements do not reward smaller towers. And I'll come to that as I go through my process, but, but to foreshadow where I'm going, if the requirement is the same for a 40 meter tower as it is for a 20 meter tower, one can expect proponents to always come forward with the 40 meter tower. What we've encouraged municipalities to do since the, since the very first protocols were put in place is give us a reward for shortening the towers and we'll push them down just as low as we can. We also have concerns with respect to the design guidelines. In some instances, they're inconsistent with the technology. And lastly, I've been hearing some banter around the council table, your worship tonight, about extending the separation distance from sensitive uses, and we have some concerns with that as well. We have a challenge. Our, our challenge is this. Over the last couple of years, the, the product and the problem that wireless, wireless carriers have to deal with has changed. Originally, when I first started using a cell phone in the early 80s, late 70s, it was a telephone. It was a, it was a voice product. Last year, for the first time, the number of bits traveling through the wireless pipeline for data exceeded the number of bits going through the pipeline for, for voice. In other words, these wireless devices that we all use, the Blackberries, the iPhones, the other products, these are now data devices just as much as they are voice devi devices. And traffic, data traffic is expected to double every year through 2014. The problem we have is that data requires exponentially greater broadband capacity. And it's this increase in capacity that requires us to provide more towers. And I'll, I'll illustrate that uh, pictorially uh, for you in a, in, a, in a few moments. The other problem we have is there are more incumbents. That means that it, as a market-driven uh, matter, there's also a requirement for, for more towers. We think that Oakville is in support generally, generically, with respect to wireless telecommunications. Telecommunications is a powerful economic enabler, and if one were to go to your economic development website, one would see that as it's identified as one of the supports for Oakville's goal to attract knowledge-based industries such as advanced manufacturing, digital media and animation, and life sciences. We also observe that you have tremendous growth ahead of you in your planned horizon to 2031 with a projected growth uh, population of 255,000, 127,000 jobs, all of which require access to the data, the network that's around us, the World Wide Web. 
What I'd like to do is very quickly talk to you about the technology and how that falls into your, the protocol. Our problem is that we have to provide a seamless environment for our customers. That means that in no place can there be a hole in the network such that a, that a call drops. And the picture in front of you shows why these are called cell phones originally, because the network is a series of cells. And here you have real life data from, from a rural community. The dark blue is, is where the towers are located. That's the greatest signal. It drops off to the lighter blue to the green where it's spotty. Yellow where you drop a call even if you're outside your, your car. Red and, and, and gray are just hopeless. Yeah, the tower, you see, fills in the hole. It's uh, quite a simple technology that, from that point of view. We also have frequency constraints. Each carrier is only assigned a certain number of frequencies. Now our problem is this, is that the network is really smart and each one of these facilities can only carry a certain number of calls. And I'm going to say 300, just, it's different for different technologies, but I'm going to say 300 tonight, sir. If you're call number 301, what happens is this, is the computer says, who's the weakest call? Where's the weakest link? And it cuts that call off from the system, hoping that the next tower over will pick it up. And thereby, effectively, the sites start shrinking in size. So our networks aren't static, they're dynamic. And the size of the networks and the night size of our cells start to shrink based on demand. And the way we deal with that over time, because over time that means that a cell's, a cell's coverage area is always smaller when it's in a, in a busy area, we have to fill that with another tower. The good news is generally these fill-in sites are shorter in height, they've got a smaller area. If one were to think of a street light, that's the way to think of these facilities. Um, short, short street lights, bright but small area, the big ones on the 400 series highways, broad light, um, not able to carry as much information, but, but over a broader area. So same thing with respect to um, uh, pedestrian traffic. Lots of callers, they start to cut the, the cell size down. We have to backfill with another rooftop installation to provide for that service. So when we're looking at your protocol, we're looking at the ability to provide service in this dynamic, um, dynamic area. Now, what, one of the problems that we have, of course, is if what I surmise from council's discussion is that there will be a motion place to put a 200 meter setback from residential uses, if that's the effect of the, of, of, of the, of the motion, then looking at your livable Oakville um, uh, plan, which if the overhead was on, I could show you. Uh, the overhead can be turned on without too much trouble. Well, we just need our friends we just to, have to, to switch screens. We just have to practice patience for a second and he'll put it up. Patience was never my strength, sir. There it comes. And they'll even zoom in for you. Thank you. So if you take a look, if we use the 401 as an example, your protocol provides an exclusion from the need to consult with the public for employment areas, which is the gray dotted area along the QEW. That's great. We've got to provide a lot of facilities along the QEW for the traveling public. You, you see new facilities coming in all the time. To the south of that, however, you have a large swath of residential. And so if the setback is to ensure that there is no new tower within residential, what that means is those holes I showed you, which are going to occur and are incurring in your residential areas to the south, will never be able to be filled. We won't be able to put towers in that area. And so your, your protocol has the ability to impact how we provide the service. So if I go back to my slides then, and I'll try to... Uh, we, we can shift you back to your slides. Um might not even take quite as long as it took to go to the overhead. Here we go. There you go. Thank you, Worship. Um, one of the other problems we have is shadowing in a municipality such as Oakville where you're growing vertically. Um, that provides a challenge for us because like light, radio waves are shadowed by buildings. And how do we fill in? We have to provide a facility on the other side to fill in the shadow. We have the same problem with respect to topography. What that means from a protocol point of view is this, is that when we're looking to provide service in the front yards and a protocol drives us to solutions in the backyards, that means that to provide the service, we have to get above the building and shoot down to hit the street, just like light. So you'll see the before and the after, lower tower in the backyard gets shadowed by the building, taller tower in the, in the backyard shoots down and gets in. Obviously, that's, that's not what any of us want to do. We're not looking for taller towers. We're looking for shorter towers. The way to do that would be to allow towers in the front yards or in the road allowances where we can keep the heights down and still meet our, our objectives. Again, another example of how your protocol can affect our network design. Same thing with respect to rooftops. As you push us away from the edge of the rooftop, we have to get higher in order to maintain the same coverage on the street. 
So what constraints are, are, are citing? Expected usage of, uh, of the service, our patterns, our network, local terrain and building types affects the, our ability to site a facility, interactions with existing radio base stations. These things are a line of sight technology, your worship, and we have to be able to see our customers with our antennas to, uh, to service them. Opportunities to use existing structures, which uh, in response to questions, I'd be happy to talk about. We love to co-locate. Co From our point of view, it's fast, it's inexpensive, it's a great solution. Visually, I have pictures here that suggest to me, you don't want it all the time. You might want it in, in employment areas. I don't think you want us to co-locate in, 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 in uh, residential areas. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your information. Uh, do any members of council have questions? Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for providing your comments. Um, just to clarify, you had shown the map, the livable Oakville map, and in, you'd shown a gray area where you had indicated that that's where you could provide service or have towers located, correct? Yes, understanding that those towers have a limited, uh, a limited range, a limited capacity, under the protocol, there's a fast track process for towers that are in that area. And, and uh, your worship, through you to the councillor, what I observed was this, is that that's a good thing from our point of view because we have to service the QEW, those people that are passing by mm -hmm. your municipality, um, and being able to provide towers quickly and easily for that purpose is, is, is good for us. Okay, so there is an area within our municipality that we provide you an opportunity whereby you can locate towers and provide service, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, the other question I have is, what if I happen to live in a hole? You had indicated in the map that there were holes in service. What if I happen to live near that hole? How would that impact me? If you were a subscriber to uh, the carrier who had the hole, then it would, it would impact on, on you a couple of ways. One is somebody would call you and your phone would not ring. Uh, you would try to call 911, you would not get a dial tone. Uh, you would attempt to send an email, the mail would not leave your device. Someone would try to send you an email, the email would not get to your device. You would be isolated from the network. Okay, um, I was going down another road, but thank you for the answer. Um, the other question I have is you had mentioned how use has changed over the years. Um, from what I understand, the biggest factor I've seen, even more so than data for Blackberries or that, is the amount of gaming that takes place on handheld devices. Is that not um, a key component of your having to have increased um, access to send out your signal so that they can provide those games to the market, to those wanting to use that service? Uh, Your Worship, again, through you to the Councillor, I haven't seen any data that suggests that. Um, the, the kinds of games that are available on the portable devices tend to be games that are, are driven on the device and don't, don't transmit data, at least the games that my child plays. Um, what, what we're seeing is tremendous passage of documents, emails, um, video calls, that kind of thing. That's, that's the kind of, of uh, statistic that I'm seeing. Okay, and nothing in terms of movies or like YouTube, that sort of thing. In other yeah. words, it's not a crucial service, life and death. It's, it's an additional service. Your Worship, I guess the problem with the pipe is this, is that a bit's a bit. It can't distinguish between the 911 call and the YouTube video. Um, users will use it as, as they will. Um, there's no doubt that people are using it for, for, uh, to watch videos off the web. There's no doubt about that at all. But there's also no doubt that in this municipality, people use it every day for 911. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, inspired by Councillor Duddock, though, I'd like to camp on to the holes in the service uh, uh, item and ask a question. Would you expect in the normal course of things that if our policy were to create gaps in the service, which would result in the denial of service to residents who'd paid for the service, that uh, we would probably hear from them wanting us to cure that. They, 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 you may if they understood that that's why there was a hole. Thank you. They, they, if they understood that's why there was a hole in the service, Your Worship, um, my expectation is that there would be complaints. I, I can say to you, Your Worship, that the reason that you, you amended your protocol last time was in fact the former mayor reported to my clients that he was getting complaints 
uh, the former mayor was getting complaints from residents with respect to the bad service. And we were called in and asked, why is service so poor in Oakville and it's so good in Mississauga? We don't get it. And, and we had a discussion with the mayor and staff about the, the impediments in the, for, not the, not the last protocol, but the protocol before that, impediments with respect to, uh, to that system. So that's a situation where some residents did get it, but, but I don't know that everybody will. But, but thank you for the answer because it, it tells me it's very strong evidence that if we create bad service, we'll hear about it. Yeah, I, because I, it happened before. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure it'll be within a day or a month, but certainly over a period of time, people will understand why there's the service constraints. And your right. clients would hear about it. Uh, they'd hear about it much faster, yes. And I have every confidence we'd hear about it from them as well. Don't know. Okay, thanks very much for that. Councillor Giddings. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned that we're either at or near capacity at the present time in most areas of Oakville. I, I, you have to understand the demographics of, of, of Oakville. Um, you know, when I look at Oakville, I'm not a resident of Oakville. This is an affluent community. It's a community with with uh, people who are professionals who are working as many professionals do outside their office. Um, and as a result, there's a lot of use of the wireless technologies by those professionals when they're away from their place, place of employment. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have from my clients a listing of all the cell sites that are at capacity, but they've said to me apocryphally that there are portions of this municipality where they're having trouble providing best of breed service because of the capacity issues. Appendix D shows us with 19 known sites. And looking at, on page four of your report, uh, data traffic expected to double each year and it's going to grow exponentially. If I do the math on that, in 2014, it appears that we'll have a need for an additional 133 towers. Am I reading that correctly? The, the, the math isn't linear. Uh, like that, um, the for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't think that that report documents all of the sites uh, within this municipality. Um, you, your staff would not be aware of sites which were exempt by Industry Canada, which went in through various exemptions. Uh, there's a database that Industry Canada maintains, which I'm sure that staff would would have access to uh, uh, if they wished, in which you could in fact plot every single radio license in this municipality and my guess is you're going to come up with uh, uh, about a hundred more than 14. I'm sorry, what was that number again? I said I, I bet you're going to come up with a hundred more than 14. Or 19, right. Sorry, right, so it, I, I agree that it's not linear but we may be looking at you're once looking we at find all these other sites it could be a doubling you're looking, at, you're looking at some more sites. Um, now, understand again that, that co-location will mean that some of these won't be new sites. These will be new sites for the carrier, but located already on an existing uh, tower. Uh, throughout Canada, most of the sites, in fact, are co-located. Uh, as I said earlier, we love co-location. It's cheap, it's fast, it's a great solution. And so if you're talking about new sites being new, newly co-located sites, I, I agree with that. Um, as your built form becomes more vertical over time, uh, rooftops become a much more successful opportunity for, uh, for, for siting. Um, your road allowance uh, over time, I think, I don't know if there's discussions ongoing with respect to your road allowance, but if it is, um, there are photographs in my presentation, which I urge council to look at, showing um, telephone pole and hydro pole type antenna structures in the road allowance. They're being used out west, great solution. Um, provides a very low visible impact. Um, solution, but also provides for a new site. So just because we've got more more sites, I guess what I'm saying in answer to your question, doesn't mean that we're having more impact of sites. Thank you. Councillor, I can tell you that one of his clients has told me that they would like to build an additional 50 sites in Oak Hill. So I think your math is actually very good. And a timely time for the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your information. Councillor Lapworth? Oh, sorry. Councillor Lapworth. Sorry, I just one quick, quick question. Um, I acquired a GPS system recently, which runs off a satellite, as you know. At what point in time could all the, uh, the telephone and data systems operate from a satellite? Your, your Worship, I, I've been getting that question since the late 80s when I started doing this work. The problem with the satellites is this, is we couldn't get enough of them in the sky to provide the capacity that we need 
to provide the service. So unless there's a completely new technology that's not thought of today through you to the councillor, satellites just aren't going to prov aren't going to provide the the service. The sky would be black. Um, and I let me please let me add that as a uh, former. Uh, satellite to cable television network operator. You might not like the eight second lag <laughs> between the, no. All right, thank you very much for your information, thank sir. Thank you, Your Worship. If I can just, as an addendum, I've just, I've just brought up the telephone, telephone pole example, which I spoke of earlier for those members of council that are interested. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Duddick, I understand you have carriage of changes. Yes. Um, I wonder if we could get a copy of this put up on the overview, seeing as it's uh, got considerable text, so that members of the public might see at the same time. Okay. Um, Councillor? Yep. Yeah. Just to be careful and sure, uh, I don't see anyone, but are there any members of the public with additional information for Council on this? Sir, would you like to come forward, identify yourself, and share your information? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, as you know me, we met before. My name is Stefan Georgeka, resident of uh, 1421 Rebecca Street. Uh, the reason I am here, I wanted to hear all what's going on, and I don't understand. I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, when the first presentation went on, uh, 3 times 29 meters is not 57. That's what I was told. It's 3 times from the residential uh, uh, border should be the tower, and said 3 times 29, 57. Uh, the second thing is, why we protect the lake from 120 meters uh, from a cell tower and uh, the daycare 20 meters from the cell tower. And nobody talked about the health issues with the World Health Organization already recognizing and uh, recommending that it's a possible cause for brain cancer and the most vulnerable, the children the little babies who are the young, not us. We, we already developed enough bone so to protect ourselves. But the young children who are very vulnerable, very thin bone, less than a quarter of an inch, uh, gets to their brain and affects them. Nobody wants to talk about this. Uh, we are just looking at distances. We are looking at convenience. We are looking at downloading movies. We are looking at everything else, but now looking at health issues. And the other thing is, when it comes to the community, the first presentation came up with a threat that Industry Canada, it's all over us. They do whatever they want in this community. We are nobodies. We are nothing. We live here. We spend every day of every hour of our lives in this community. But Industry Canada comes over and says, I'm going to put this tower in here, and you guys have to live with it. Excuse me, sir. I have a constitutional right. And all of us do have a constitutional right. If you want to put it down in your report, only thing we want, we want to vote for what's going on in our community. And nobody can deny that from us. I want my right to vote for what's going on in my community. If somebody wants to put up a tower, I want my community to decide over it. And I want a vote. That's the only thing I want. Okay, and nobody can deny. The country cannot deny it. This is a free country, democracy. Nobody can deny a vote from us. So let's vote, and if we vote no, then it's not going to go there. If we vote yes, let's put it up there. That's the only thing we ask for. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. Thank you for your information. Um, did you want, uh, first off, thank you for the correction uh, from 57 to 87. Good catch. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, secondly, health issues uh, were covered in the report. It was explained by the staff that we're excluded by the Canadian government from that uh, area. And all the discussion we've had about separation distances is, if you will, a proxy uh, for trying to get at that, in my view. So where you see uh, 
when you see Councillor Duddick changing the 20 meters to 200 meters, that's us trying to solve the health problem without getting into the health problem since we're forbidden to go in there. So, and then thirdly, as for voting on towers, uh, as I understand it, the only vote you get on towers is who you choose for your MP. It's a federal matter. Yes, uh, Your Worship, but when there is a debate and there is uh, something it's, uh, uh, we can get along with it, then we can choose to vote again. Yes. It's the Constitution allows us, the Constitution allows us, if we don't like something, with elected officials which we voted for and we don't like it, then we can vote. If they, if they don't agree with what the, most of the public agrees with, we can change that vote around. You, I, that's my understanding. You can, you, can, you can certainly change your representative at an election. That's right. And we have the system we have. Um, it, it was here before we got here. So I can't change, I can't change the federal constitution. I'm a mayor. And yes, I understand that. But that's not that you cannot change it. People have changed the whole world around several times, and they will change it again. We've, we've had when it's needed. In my lifetime, we've had two major attempts to change the Canadian Constitution, uh, but we wander away from the topic. I'm not now. talking about Constitution. I'm talking about the entire world. Anyway, uh, uh, the other thing is the other thing is uh, uh, talking about uh, the uh, the health issues. Uh, let's not ignore it. Health Canada, uh, like the World Health Organization, has two scientists from Canada which are members of the World Health Organization, and that's why uh, Health Canada is going to look into it next year and revise the whole yes. situation. So, so let's so not rush these things right. uh, so too far ahead. So messages for Health Canada need to be given to Health Canada. Yeah. Is we do that all we're trying constantly. to do. Okay? We do that constantly. We, we do that nonstop. Perfect. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your information. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I wonder if you could just turn it over for me, please. Um, Councillor uh, DeMoff and I have been working on this along with the uh, mayor who's been assisting as well, so I thank you for that. Um, the recommendation that report PD-074-11 regarding the proposed telecommunications facility protocol be received and two, that draft telecommunications facilities protocol attached as appendix E to this report be adopted on an interim basis as amended as follows. A, all instances of letters of municipal concurrence and municipal concurrence be deleted and replaced with municipal letter of concurrence on facility design and public consultation, bracketed municipal letter of concurrence. B, the setback for telecommunication facilities from any sensitive land use in section 3.4.2 of the draft telecommunications facility protocol be increased to 200 meters. Uh, Councillor DeMoff indicated that we should also provide 6.1.1 as well as 3.2a to indicate that that 200 meter also um, is comparable because it refers to that 120, so those figures should also be changed, just so you know. And C, uh, calculation of radio frequency radio exposure measured at the nearest sensitive land use be added to the complete application contents of section 4.2 as a new subsection I and D, the first sentence of section 6.28 be deleted and replaced with where signage is proposed to be attached to any telecommunications facility, as staff comment on that. Three, that the fee for issuing a municipal letter of concurrence on facility design and public consultation be set at $5,000, and that staff undertake consultation and report back to council on any further amendments at a later date. Um, and I don't know if we have to include that section uh, 4.2b that Councillor DeMoff referred to about the four sides or whether that'll be coming back. Okay, thank you. Councillor, uh, could you also include uh, under section 2 an item E? If you didn't, I don't think you caught this. Uh, uh, in uh, section 3.2a, um, 
to change the 120 meters there? That's right. I mentioned 6.1.1 as well as 3.2A. Okay. okay, so that they reflect. I was listening too slowly. <laughs> Thank you. Glad you caught that. All right. Uh, discussion, Council? Councilor Adams. Thank you very much for adding in that extra piece. I appreciate that a great deal. Can I just ask our staff to uh, help clarify for me the exclusion in the case of um, uh, uh, 3.2A? Um, we're only talking about the public consultation piece, whereas 3.4 is talking about whether or not you would provide a letter. Um, could, could we choose to require the uh, the exclusion in 3.2A to not refer to the community sensitive locations? I mean, could you make it broader so that if it's within 200 meters of the edge of the employment area, whatever might be on the other side of the, the border? Not being clear to you, I can see. If, for example, you're in employment land and you've got residential lands adjacent to them, if you're within 200 meters, you may not have a daycare or a, a private school or... Councillor, sensitive <laughs> uses includes residential. Does it say house? Then I forget it. Thank you. Any others? Councillor DeMoff. I actually just, I, I hadn't said this before, but to thank the staff for all their work on coming up with a draft. Um, I also fully support what we're, we've got here. I think it's important for us to have a made in Oakville protocol that meets the needs of, of our residents. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see this come, the, the amendments coming forward. Thank you for that. Any others? I'll call the vote then. All in favor of the motion? Opposed, if any? The uh, motion carries. All right, Council. We now come to the Brawny Heritage Resources Review and Strategy. And, oh, there it is. Right in the front of the station. And uh, we have a presentation from Susan Shepard. And if you'll give her your attention, we will be edified. Thanks, we'll just give it a second here. Your document is... Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight to present the Brawny Village Heritage Resources Review and Strategy to you. Bit of a change of pace from our last application, uh, going from the future back to the past. Um, I'd like to point out that this study has been a long time in the making, um, and we are uh, very relieved to have it before you today. The Brawny Village Heritage Resources Review and Strategy uh, was required to be completed by Livable Oakville. Um, and there were a number of uh, items that the Livable Oakville plan um, outlined for us to cover in such a strategy, and we have endeavored to do so. Uh, to give you a brief outline, the study area uh, map is in front of you, but it basically runs to the south along the lake um, and then the, the northern boundaries uh, hit up as far as Rebecca Street uh, to the east, we're on East Street, and then to the west we pick up along West Street and then uh, up along uh, Bronte, Bronte Road. Uh, the map that's in front of us right now actually uh, is a development area map which shows um, how the uh, the built construction of Bronte has evolved over time. And so you'll note that the uh, most of the blue areas have, uh, which denote um, historic or older uh, construction in the village, uh, have been picked up within our study area, of course. Um, to just very briefly describe this study, uh, it, it 
It has a number of sections and generally begins with the uh, a section on the history of Bronte. Um, and for that uh, section, I would like to thank the uh, Bronte Historical Society who did help us in compiling and editing that portion of the document. Uh, we go on to uh, list all of the uh, protected heritage resources that are either designated under the Ontario Heritage Act or listed on our heritage register. And in Appendix B of the report, we outline uh, as much of the lost heritage of Bronte that we could find existing photo documentation of. Section four of the study is probably uh, the area uh, that has the most meat or interest to, uh, to our residents and to council. Uh, a number of points that are outlined there are, uh, are, very, are based on the best practices in heritage conservation. And you have seen uh, many of those strategies outlined in uh, the North Oakville Heritage Resources Review that was presented to council several years ago. Um, i just like to point out uh, point eight uh, of, the, of section four, which describes um, options that are available to the community on how we move forward um, to, uh, to protect the remaining heritage resources in Bronte. And just to highlight several of them, um, while staff acknowledge that there has been a serious loss of heritage fabric in Brawny, uh, there may still be some potential for a heritage conservation district in certain areas, but that a heritage conservation district could only happen without very, uh, with very strong support uh, from the community. They would in fact have to demand and support a heritage conservation district in order for it to work in that area. Um, we go on to outline several other planning tools that can be used as alternative strategies uh, to protect uh, the remaining heritage resources, um, including infill housing guidelines, uh, streetscape guidelines, and community improvement plans. There are a number of recommendations that are brought forward in, uh, in the Brawny Village Heritage Resources Review and Strategy. Um, the first two are, are rather general, that the study be used as a reference tool and a guide for managing future heritage conservation in Brawny Village, and that the general, general conservation strategies of Section 4.0 be implemented by staff. Um, but the last three points, the last three recommendations, I think are key to uh, to actually implementing um, heritage planning uh, preservation tools. Uh, what we staff feel is that uh, in order to properly explain uh, the impact of a heritage conservation district and the alternative planning tools that we've very briefly touched on in the report, we require a public information meeting in order to explain this to them and to have time to uh, answer their questions and, and allow them to provide feedback. Um, in addition, uh, we recognize that not all members of the public would be able to attend public meetings and therefore we will be doing our best efforts to obtain feedback through uh, distribution of surveys uh, that we would collect to, uh, to find out uh, residents and stakeholder opinions on uh, what their preferred methods are for uh, heritage preservation in Brawny Village. Should council accept and endorse this report tonight, uh, we would be looking at holding a public consultation meetings probably in uh, mid to late January. That would be in order to give us enough time to come up with a uh, communication strategy uh, that would allow us to effectively reach the most residents as possible and to, uh, to provide them information on what we want to actually discuss with them and the information we'd like to share. So the recommendation before you tonight is to um, uh, receive uh, the Brawny Village uh, Heritage Resources Review and Strategy and to uh, endorse the recommendations uh, therein. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or uh, comments that, uh, that you might have. Thank you very much for the presentation and the underlying report. Uh, questions? Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Mayor, through you. Thank you for the report uh, and all the time and effort you've taken to put it together. And also, I'd like to thank, at this time, the Historical Society for their input and time. A um, couple of questions. It's regarding the, the Pioneer Cemetery, which uh, didn't come up tonight. But could you tell us uh, where it is in the restoration list? And 
the Certainly. status? Um, the, the Brawny Pioneer Cemetery, it's not specifically referred to in the report, but it is. it does show up as one of our inventory sheets because it is a designated property under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, we did follow up with Heather Turn, the manager of Harbors and Cemeteries, in order to find out the timeline for projected restoration of that cemetery. The information we received from her was that um, uh, the Brawny Pioneer Cemetery is scheduled approximately for uh, 2017 for restoration. Um, apparently that information was brought forward in a report to Heritage Oakville um, in 2008. Thank you. Are there any unsafe monuments at that uh, cemetery at this time? Do you know? Um, I don't believe I'm qualified to answer unsafe. I know there are several damaged monuments. Um, uh, I believe that Harbors and Cemeteries staff uh, in 2008 did a, a collective inventory at that time to um, remove any hazardous uh, stones, but I can't tell you what work has gone on in recent years regarding that. Okay, I guess it might not be you, but uh, you don't know if there's an annual inspection? I can't answer that. Okay. Um, maybe staff could get back to me on this one then. Uh, who should members of the public contact if they notice any damage or unsafe stones in the cemetery? Um, I, I would ask them to contact Heather Turin. Yeah, she's the manager of Harbors and Cemeteries. Her contact information is available on the town website. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'll be talking to her about that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions? Oh, Councillor Robinson. Thank, uh, thank you, Worship. What is a pioneer cemetery? Um, Sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, a pioneer cemetery would be the, the burying ground of the founding families of the Brawny area, to the best of my oh, knowledge. What, what does the word pioneer signify? Anything in particular? Uh, it signifies historic significance, certainly. And this cemetery hasn't really been used. At, to the best of my knowledge, it is no longer an active cemetery. Well, if it's a pioneer. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> if it's a pioneer cemetery and of historical significance, <coughs> why has it been allowed to get in the condition that it currently is in and has been in and will be in for another six years? I'm not uh, sure the councillors as... As, um, as vital as this is, it's, it's really outside of her remit or her mandate. Uh, so um, maybe, you could, maybe you could agree to hold those questions for appropriate staff on another occasion? Well, I think that the appropriate staff, they're appropriate enough, they, they're here and they've heard my questions, so maybe they'd be thoughtful enough just to run with them and get back to Alan and I with the answers. Perfect. Perfect. Certainly I just, I just didn't want Ms. Shepard to... I, I understand that. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any others? <coughs> Councillor Johnston. I'll move the staff report. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, I know we have several... Okay. At the appropriate time, we will come back to you. Uh, we have three listed delegations. I'll just ask at this point, uh, is there anyone here with information for Council on this item who has not already registered as a delegation? All right, then. Madam Clerk, would you please call uh, Ms. McAlpine, our first delegation? Barbara Ann McAlpine is our first delegation, Mr. Mayor. Very well done. Thank you very much. Ms. Al Ms. McAlpine, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor and Councillors. Um, I'm Barbara Ann McAlpine, and I'm here representing the board of the Bronte Historical Society. Um, the board was very pleased to see the, this long-awaited report um, that was finally completed. Um, we've waited for it very anxiously, and we, and we were very pleased. I think the staff has done a wonderful job. It, it's a really good report. Um, as, as they mentioned, much of Bronte's heritage has been lost, and it's important not to waste any more time to try and keep what is appropriate to save. Um, so we are asking council to endorse this report and instruct staff to take the next necessary steps just as soon as possible. And if I may, in answer to 
Councillor Johnson, I have a whole album full of pictures of broken and sunken stones on both Broadie Cemetery and Merton. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, the, the, um, are there any questions for Ms. McAlpin? Thank you very much. The next delegation is Linda Oliver on behalf of the Barney Village Residents Association. Ms. Oliver, welcome. <laughs> Council looks forward to your information. Thank you. Your Worship, uh, Mayor Burton and members of town, uh, Oakville Town Council, regarding the Bronte Village Heritage Residents uh, Resources uh, Review and Strategy. The Bronte Village Residents Association has been involved in Bronte-related municipal activities for the past 10 years. The BVRA has been particularly eager to participate in initiatives and events that help preserve the ambience and character that Bronte retains and continues to offer. Through the years, members of the BVRA have participated in heritage preservation related town hall, charades, meetings, presentations, and development application reviews. Most, if not all, of these interventions can be summarized under common themes. Retain the historical charm of Bronte's uh, fishing village past. Retain the character of small town living and embrace the sense of place that Bronte offers our residents. We are thrilled that the Heritage Planning Department of Oakville Planning Services has prepared the Bronte Village Heritage Resources Review and Strategy Report, and we heartily endorse the Bronte Historical Society's support of the report's objectives, conclusions, and recommendation. We urge Council to approve the report and the re recommendations indicated in Section 6 of the report. Furthermore, we look forward to, the, to participating in the recommended public information meetings. The strategies for preservation should be enacted without delay and before more development applications are received, applications which will continue to challenge Bronte's unique character. It is not an easy process and the proposed study is the first crucial step for the crafting of a strategy and a framework from which to proceed. We would respectfully suggest that timelines be assigned to each recommendation or step so that Bronte residents can look forward to when they can expect achieve achievements for each step. We look forward to working with the planning development, uh, or planning department rather, on this project. On behalf of the BVRA, I'm reading this for uh, Lori McGinn, the president of Bronte Village Residents Association, and I'm the vice president. Thank you very much. Uh, Nance? Thank you. There you, you go. have a copy. Okay. Appreciate yeah. that. Any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Is Andy Bruce, again, with regard to this item, uh, representing ASB? Mr. Bruce, uh, we're delighted to see you again. Do you have something new for us? Not really. Uh, it is. Uh, I think that the Barbara... And the BVRA have... Uh, if, if you would pull the microphone oh, toward you yep, or put are. yourself toward it, yep. well, it'll so assist there you. There we go. There we go. Thank Sorry. you. Um, I'm not... Uh, they've, they've said what we need. Uh, we have to move as, as quick as we can. Um, and I'm just going to give a little uh, illustration of uh, uh, how fast it changes. Um, I had a, a long conversation yesterday with a owner of a subdivided property on, on Seneca Street. I'm, you councillors may know about the one we subdivided into two. And uh, the, the two owners bought this property, it split on different set owners. And I met the owner of the one that has not been started development. They haven't got the money right now and they're waiting for a while. And they then came and were looking at this building has now gone up beside their lot and they were horrified. And I can't explain, express anything. It's completely out of character, et cetera, of, of the area. And uh, then uh, we then met today, the next day, uh, another owner has bought one pro uh, another property beside the one that is terrible looking building or it's not gonna be in character. We have a couple of them, but this is what it is. So the urgency is did, more- Did you than, say on Seneca? On Seneca. Fascinating. On the north side. 
there, these are the, the, the house that is being constructed that I would say is an ugly house, but I'm only an architect. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's going to be changing the whole character of the building uh, area, etc. very dramatically when we start getting these because it, it's a skyball thing. So the faster we can get it under control, if we can get it under control, the faster the study goes is going to be better. Now, I'd, unfortunately, I don't think we can put a holding thing on and say, okay, we're going to do a study, you know, everything holds. All we can do is go around and encourage the people, but, you know, here we have two builders build, and these are builders. These aren't people, the, the one couple are going to live there. Why they bought the house, because they like the character of the area. And I hope, I assume all you councillors and everything are pretty familiar with this, why the study is here, we have to see the report. And that, is, it's the character of the area, no sidewalks, great canopies of trees. That's what we want to try and protect in the one area I'm sp speaking of. The other area on the west, east side of the creek is, if you've been up there, it's the same thing. It is changing so fast with the co small cottages going down and some, and I will say some are big and ugly, but we have some very nice ones that are going in. We can have infill and changes that are supporting the character and that's what if we can get some this going as fast as we can we have a chance to probably I hope save Bronte and some of its heritage. Thank you. Well thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad we could make you as happy as we did. <laughs> well you haven't passed it and you haven't, and I haven't seen it. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, I'll restrict it to table and I'll look to. Uh, Is there anybody else? I beg your pardon? I don't know. There's not anybody else that has to speak. I asked. Oh. But I'll ask again. Sorry. Has anybody changed their mind since we began receiving delegations and become moved by a spirit to share additional information with Council? Madam Clerk, would you like to look? I looked. Thank you. All right. Then now I'll restrict it to table and I'll turn to the ward that contains historic Brawny. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move the staff recommendations so we can start moving forward as fast as possible. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Other discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any, it is adopted. Um, Council, are you satisfied with the report you received on the, uh, can, this is a whole, this is a, re a, a return item, so I'm not sure if you really want a full presentation. Item four, the Town of Oakville response to the Halton Region Economic Development Strategic Directions Report. Uh, Councillor Knoll. I'd be prepared to move that if uh, there's no desire for a report or uh, presentation. I see no evidence of any need to detain anyone any longer on this item. Councillor Knoll has moved the staff recommendation. All in favor? Opposed, if any? And it is adopted. I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, um, C2, the confidential discussion item. Do you want to skip over that and deal with the advisory committee minutes before we go into camera? As we will need to go into camera. Councillor Duddick, thank you for the motion as presented in the agenda. All in favor? Opposed to Finney. And that too is adopted. So now, if we could have a mover for, I want to word this. We need a motion uh, that this committee resolve into closed meeting session for the purpose of dealing with a matter pertaining to C2 litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality and with respect to confidential discussion item C2, as I just said. Councillor Robinson, thank you for that. All in favor? Opposed, if any. That carries. Madam Clerk, would you please arrange the chamber for a closed meeting? All right, I'll call this uh, public session uh, back into order. Uh, council has met in a closed meeting for the purpose of dealing with a matter pertaining to litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality and with, and with respect to confidential discussion item C2 and given instruction to staff. And that brings us now to, on our agenda, uh, a request for a motion to rise and report to Council. Councillor Lapworth, thank you. All in favor? Opposed to Finney. I rise and report that Council has met in Committee of the Whole and made decisions on public hearing item one, discussion items two, three, and four, confidential discussion item C2, 
and advisory committee minutes item five. And I look for a move and seconder of this report. Councillor Grant, thank you. Councillor Elgar, thank you. All in favor? Opposed, if any. The report is adopted. Is there any new business of emergency congratulatory or condolence? Um, members of council, I'd, I'd like to tell you that earlier today, uh, our colleague, Councillor Khan, was uh, admitted to Toronto General Emergency. Um, and he's expecting transfer to another hospital tomorrow. And he made the following request, which I convey to you. He said that uh, he doesn't need your flowers or attention yet. He's before treatment, but he would appreciate your prayers. And uh, with that, I think we come to consideration and reading of the bylaws. And uh, I need a mover and seconder for bylaws 2011, 109, and 121. Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Um, all in favor? Opposed, if any. The bylaws are adopted. That uh, completes our agenda. Thank you for your time and attention. We are adjourned. <laughs>